Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Well, welcome to this webinar on why empowering developers to write secure code is the next wave of application security and how to do it efficiently. My name is Matthias Madu, CTO and co-founder of Secure Code Warrior. And with me today is joining Sean Madigan, our rock star out of the UK. Sean? Hey, Matthias. Hi, guys. Thanks for tuning into this webinar. My name is Sean Madigan, responsible for customer success in the EMEA region. Back to you, Matthias. Thanks, Sean. Let's have a look at the agenda for today. Um, we'll start off by defining the problem of software security, what are the challenges today, and why empowering developers requires a positive approach. Sean will take, a, take this over because he's our guy in the field. And Sean will provide you guys with a blueprint um, for your secure coding program. And as he's in the field, he can definitely talk you through some case studies. And we'll finish it up with some key takeaways. Actually, I started my career at Ghent University um, pursuing a PhD in application security. And with my PhD, I moved to um, uh, the US, joined a, at that time, small company called Fortify. And um, one of the first presents that I received from my manager at that time was actually the XKCD uh, on top of it. And when we moved into our office here in Bruges, I actually took out the XKCD and wanted to hang it. And something struck me. You know, at the, at the, at the, at the um, back of the XKCD, it actually said, um, Merry Christmas. But it was signed 2008. That is actually 10 years ago. Um, and at that time, um, that was a, not a new thing. SQL injection was not a new thing in 2008. It was already a decade old. Um, so what we're doing today in application security are we're still trying to fix a problem which is at least two decades old. We're still trying to figure out how to get rid of all the problems in the OWASP top 10. So how is that possible? And there's actually, I think, a number of reasons. Um, but before I go into more depth of these reasons why, and uh, to take you through, uh, I would like to take you through a couple of numbers. I'm actually a numbers person. And um, to, to quote the former CEO of Nets, uh, Netscape, he once said, if there is data, let's look at the data. If you all have an opinion, let's go with mine. So my suggestion here would be to look at some data. One in three of the newly scanned applications had a SQL injection over the past five years. When I saw that number, I really thought that two out of three did not have a database. No, seriously, all kidding aside, this is super high. If one in three applications still has SQL injection, which is two decades old, which is a known problem with a relatively easily fix, well, it makes me really wonder how many applications are vulnerable to the rest of the OWASP top 10. SQL injection is the number one in OWASP top 10. And it's actually, it's not only that. The number one is injection problems. It's SQL injection, it's LDAP injection, all the injection problems. And so it's even if only a fraction of the number one category in OWASP top 10. So if that is the priority in the field to get rid of SQL injection, I think we're pretty much failing. So the question really is, if you see this number, why can't we keep up with fixing problems in code? Why are problems still existing and why are known problems not fixed fast enough? The reality is that fixing a problem late in the development life cycle is really, really expensive. It is 30 times more expensive than fixing that same problem in the IDE, according to NIST. So, if you're in the IDE and you get some real-time feedback on deprecated functions, on you need to use escaping the input, you need to parameterize queries, when that is happening real in real life in the IDE, that is much more efficient than wait until the very last moment in the SDLC, get that back, and then you have to start fixing that particular problem. It's really costly, and a lot of people in the entire organization will be involved in fixing that one problem found very, very late in the development life cycle. So you may wonder, why is that so expensive? If you find something in production, well, you just tell the developer, and he's going to fix it, and it's going to be in, 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 in the code, you know, and it's going to be rolled out. That is not true, right? We all know that if you find a problem, it has to be filed in a bug tracking system. It has to be split up 
amongst the developers. The developer has to take that bug and has to work himself back into the code of a while back. It may be the case that he has written that code a month ago or a year ago. Or how about fixing a problem of a developer that already left? That takes time. Next up, it has to go through QA, QA, staging, and production. To make an analogy, if you're building a house and you're entirely done with your house and you finally have your dream house, at that point when you realize that all the electricity is, is wired incorrectly or even worse, the electricity is not even in there, the, sorry, the wiring is not even in there, well, it is very, very costly to put the correct wiring into the house when it's totally, totally finished, when it's entirely finished. So it's, it's going to be costly, and the same is true with bugs. If you're done with your code, if it's in production, going to go back and fix something is very costly for your business. Going back to finding problems late in the development lifecycle. There are a number of reports out there that state that bugs found late in the SDLC are super expensive. This is um, from Slashdot, but there's also statistics from Contrast. There's even statistics by Jim Ralph from Aetna, who calculated that within Aetna, it cost him over $14,000 to fix a problem in maintenance mode. My suggestion over here is to really do that for your own organization. Figure out what kind of solutions um, you have internally, um, what you're spending on these solutions, but also what you're spending on the people um, trying to eradicate problems. And do this exercise yourself. Figure out how much it costs to get rid of security problems in your organization. And you may wonder, is it really that costly to fix a problem in production? Jim Ralph said, in production, it costs you 14000 but assume that you do not find the problem in production. Assume that somebody else is finding the problem and is actually taking advantage of that problem. Well, according to IBM Security, the, in 2018, Eden, there was an average cost of $3.86 million for a breach. That is a good 6% increase because it was 3.6 um, Six million loss here because I actually did a presentation on optimizing your budget what you can actually do with 3.6 million in security so 3.6 million if you do the previous calculation if you know exactly what you're spending on fixing security problems and it is for example a thousand bucks to fix a code in um, the IDE or in your staging environment if you're able to nail down a number you can figure out how much it costs you and how many issues you can potentially fix with 3.86 million. For example, if it costs you a thousand bucks to fix a coding mistake at a certain stage during the SDLC, you can fix 3,860 issues. So how did we end up here in application security? Why do we not get rid of this particular problem? Main question is, why are developers not writing secure code? Or even better, why does security um, not secure the code? Because it's a department in your organization, so you would assume they're securing your code. Let's have a look at um, the security versus developers. First of all, a number again. Um, one application security person per 100 developers in your organization. There's clearly a talent shortage for, for security people and especially for application security people. If you look at some studies out there, then uh, there are studies that say that 1.64 application security experts per 100 developers, that's what the BSIM study says. Um, so that's, a, that's slightly more. Um, but if you think about BSIM, BSIM is a study on real organizations that already thought about application security. These people are in the study because they think they are convinced that application security is important and they are already putting an effort into their organization to make sure that security issues are not entering their code. So they are already serious about application security. So that's pretty much the top level. You know, 1.64, that's pretty much the top level of the number of application security experts in your organization. That is very unfortunate. Let's have a look at what one person has to do. That one person has to train, educate, 
guide and steer developers in writing secure code. On top of that, that one person has to work with external parties. That one person has to um, ask for penetration tests and um, look through the results, um, or they go through the static analysis results. On top of that, that one person does not only have to work with 100 developers, but also with the security architects, conducting threat modeling, doing um, architectural risk analysis, and so on and so forth. So, as you can see, that one person um, is quite quickly overwhelmed with all the work that that person needs to do. Let's, let's take it even one step further. Let's have a look at, at the builders, so the people that are trying to secure your application, which includes the software uh, developers and the application security experts that try to guide the developer in writing secure codes, and the breakers. Um, when you're asking for a pen test or when a tool is running on your application pointing out problems into your application. So first of all, you have the builders. They have to be always right. They have to write code without any security problem in there because the breakers, they only need to find one problem and they are golden. And let's be honest, it is quite easy for breakers, right? If you do not tell the developers in the first place what you're going to look for, um, how you're going to do it, and so on and so forth. So if you're not telling the, the, the builders um, what you're going to do afterwards, how you're going to test this application, well, it's quite hard for the builders to have it always right. At the same time, builders, they consider their code as their baby. They are super proud of what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and they should because they are writing um, uh, very nice features. So when this unknown person comes in, and he calls your baby ugly, well, of course, that's not going to be the, good, the start of a good relationship between the builders and the breakers. On top of that, um, 9 out of 10, the breaker does point out the problem, but doesn't really give him, like, hands-on guidance on how to solve that. Um, I, I all too often see reports where they say, hey, you know what, um, you have a cross-site scripting problem and I can give you some technical details. You know, this is an attack vector and a URL. And by the way, I'm going to also give you some guidance on how to fix it. Um, well, you can fix that with input validation and output encoding. And that is it. While that is true, that is way too high level. It doesn't come down to what the developer really has to do in their code. Um, they really need to figure out for their technology, for their code, how can I do input validation, how should I do output validation. So they really need um, hands-on guidance. On top of that, developers are really asking, like, well, what is security really doing? We have a department for that one. So we would assume that security is sprinkling some some um, magic fairy dust over our code and everything is going to be secure. Um, so why are they so slow? Why are they coming back with problems that we introduced months ago or even years ago? The problem is tools take time. That's one thing. Um, also, tools tend to be inaccurate. There are false positives in there. There are false negatives in there. False positives, static analysis solutions come up with um, a ton of issues, and not all of them are real. False negatives, when you um, assume you fix all your problems in your code and you're still hacked, it means that your tool was not able to find a particular problem in your code. So you have false negatives. So why is that? Why can this not be uh, in real time? Why can we not get some information from security in real time? Um, the problem over here is um, what we're trying to do in traditional application security is we're trying to move more and more things to the left. All right. So we're trying to find in the SDLC, I'm sorry, we're trying to move more and more things left in the SDLC. We're trying to find the vulnerability early on in um, the SDLC. So while we are writing, we're trying to find um, the problem with traditional application security. And that may lead to a couple things. Okay, so if you're trying to find the SQL injection or the cross-site scripting um, while you're coding, for example, or if you're asking your developers to fix a cross-site scripting issue um, because it's found in, in, in um, the penetration testing, well, there's, there's a couple of reactions that you can get from developers. So first of all, um, 
they will challenge you. They want to make sure that the, the stuff that you're asking them to do is an actual problem, you know? Um, so they may ask you like, hey, well, I do understand from a theoretical perspective that this is a problem, but can you please give me an exploit? And all too often, that is the start of a, of a really bad relationship between security and developers where they are more focused on trying to find the exploit than simply to try to fix the issue and make sure that it doesn't come back. Second, if a developer isn't really educated on security, they may really ask what the problem is. If you tell them if, if your pen test report shows a box with cross-site scripting in there, um, the developer may say, well, what is the problem with just showing a cross-site scripting box in my website? Um, they may not understand the underlying problem of cross-site scripting and everything that can be done with cross-site scripting. So essentially, we need to educate the developer. We have to make sure that the developer understands um, why this is important for your organization. So how can we empower your developers? How can we teach your developers so that they understand this particular problem and they are more receptive to um, fixing the found issues? Well, what we would like to do is um, we would like to empower developers. We would like to have a positive approach to um, security. So how can we do that? Um, there's a couple of, of fundamental things over here. Um, so one of the fundamental things about empowering developers is that it really requires a different approach. So today there's a lot of tools out there and Gartner has a lot of acronyms like SAS, YAST, RASP and DAS. So we're essentially throwing more technology on the problem. What we're ignoring over here is, um, well, it's still people that need to do that. You know, we're still having developers that need to code. Um, and still, on, on top of that, the technology that we're throwing at them, SAS, ESP, RASP, and DAS, um, they are negative. Um, they point out mistakes. They point out problems in your code. They are definitely not empowering the developer. Empowering the developer is really you teach them how to code securely. You tell them what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. You want to help him. You want to help him with writing secure code. So um, developers, well, developers, they, they, are, they are really unique. Every developer is unique. They are creative. They are problem solvers. They are inquisitive. Um, and, and, a, and a company needs to tap into that for security too. We know what they're good at, so we really need to tap into that. So you need to win your developers for you so they can become your first line of defense. We need positiveness in security, not always the negativeness, not the negativeness from the AST solutions that are out there. I would say the developers are your backbone. So um, if, if tools would be able to fix everything, well, um, um, why are we still here? Why are we still having all these security problems if tools were able to do it? We're trying to throw tools at the solution for the last 10, 15 years, and we're, we're not making progress. So before I move it over to Sean, I would like to point out a couple things. Um, There's some, some very helpful uh, resources and content that we can provide you with. So first of all, there's the fast guide to uh, leveling up your um, the, uh, dev team. In there, uh, we give you a, a blueprint that we're also going to discuss today. So if you want to know more about this, you can definitely read the first two, the fast guide to leveling up your development, as well as empowering developers to write secure code. Third, there's game of codes in which we um, go through a customer study, in which we go through what we've done at a um, financial institution um, and how we've done and rolled out um, a positive security message within the organization, which was definitely accepted by the developers. Last but not least, um, keep an eye on our next webinar. In October, we're doing a, a next webinar um, on a different topic. And with this, I would like to hand it over to Sean. Thanks, Matthias. Um, I like that quote from the Net, uh, Netscape CEO. If there is data, let's look at the data. And that's what we've been doing at Secure Code Warrior over the last couple of years when we're rolling out and helping organizations with 25 developers to 25 plus thousand developers in rolling out a secure coding program. 
and really the do's and don'ts and the best practices has been have been etched into all of our customer success folk here at Secure Code Warrior. And I'm delighted to share the blueprints and best practices today with you. So ne next slide, please, Matthias. But before we delve into the best practices and do's and don'ts, I want to set um, expectations. Um, an engaging and successful uplift program uh, and secure coding program does not happen overnight. It takes buy-in from developers, stakeholders, and it does take resources. And like the analogy you see in the screen before, you can actually run and sprint. You have to learn how to crawl and then walk. So looking at the crawling phase, you have really this is about understanding the basics. What are my goals? Does it tie into the application security program overall? What are my developers going to think? Have I got buy-in from developers? Um, will this content engage my developers? Is it the right type of content? Um, and understanding at a high level how you want to over uh, sorry roll out um, a secure coding program, who's involved, and even focus on priorities and if there if there's technology required to do this. When you're in the walking stage, it's really your test driving um, the secure coding program. Um, you've onboarded a couple of developers, maybe a couple of teams, to really test drive and see which works and which doesn't work. And in the endeavor to create a more a wider and more general onboarding program for the remaining of the organization and really tying it into the metrics. When you're at the running phase, it's all about um, onboarding the remaining developers. Your, your program is up and ready. It's running. Um, you're, you're tying into the metrics and success criteria that you've set out at the very start. Uh, you're beginning to scale that secure code and excellence and empowering developers and breaking down the silos between security and development. And really, you're building to, uh, a case of ROI and, and causing impact in the organization. So as I mentioned, the, f the first step is understanding your goals and, and priorities. And when we go into an organization, we've seen in the past that, you know, there's multi every organization is different and every organization will have a different goal compared to the next organization. But generally, when we go into an organization, we see the following three goals um, outweigh any other. One is it awareness. So are you providing awareness training to developers for the first time? Two, it could be training. You know, have you um, onboarded developers in the past with an awareness program? Now you really want to structurally embed a, a training, a continual training program for developers. Or is it skill verification? So are you embedding um, a career development path um, in terms of secure coding? Are you actually um, embedding this into the hiring process, being competent, confident that you're hiring competent developers? Or really, it could be a combination of all three. It depends on the organization. But once you set your high-level goals, then it's actually about unlocking more information and with that information, creating a more strategic plan to roll out your secure coding program. Next slide, please, Matthias. So a part of this is actually working through a value framework with, with our clients. Um, on the right hand or on the left hand side you can see understanding your, your developers. So how many developers have I in the organization? And this will give you the size of scale um, and, and maybe resources that you will need. Location of developers is really an important aspect and some clients overlook this. If you're a multinational organization, you'll have cultural differences between um, different countries or even different continents and understanding those is actually a, a crucial to an onboarding program. Even what languages and frameworks, there's no point um, focusing mobile developers on web app and web app developers on mobile. You have to be specific, you have to give developers what they need. And maybe, there's ident uh, maybe you have to identify the risks, maybe there's an upcoming project that could hinder a an onboarding plan or a, um, um, a secure coding plan and that has to take priority right there and then. So understanding all these factors about your development um, structure and organization is absolutely key. And, and simultaneously, you also have to look at what has been done in the past. If you're new to the organization, it's always good to build a relationship with stakeholders and ask them what has been done in the past to, up, uh, to empower developers, whether that be tooling or in terms of training, and learning from past mistakes or even past, uh, past um, victories. It could be well that you know you had an effective communication plan before that you want to embed in this new secure code training uh, program, or it might be um, that maybe security didn't get involved as much, or developers, the stakeholders in the development community didn't get involved as much, and that's something that you want to change, but you've learned from the past. 
And then looking at your desired outcome, so we kind of touched on this with the overall goals and objectives of this, but really looking, focusing in on what are your goals, and then what are the stakeholders' goals, and do these fit into the overall application security program? And again, we have more information there about goals and priorities, but really the most, one of the most important factors then is when you've established your goals and priorities is looking at the success, success metrics. Because like what the CEO of Netscape said, you know, if there is data, let's look at data. And at the end of a year or end of your program, that's what you're going to reflect on. Have I met my um, success criteria? And when we go into clients, the number one success, success metric is engagement because um, if developers are engaged as a byproduct, you'll see skills being built, you'll see a, um, a reduction in vulnerability density. But measuring engagement, is, there's a number of different tiers in how you can do this. Maybe it's the amount of content or trained developers have consumed. Maybe it's the amount of web sessions that developers have consumed in, in a certain training platform. And maybe you can link this back then to maybe pin test re uh, reports or SAS reports of you know, particular vulnerabilities. But really it's about cause and impact and understanding those success met metrics that you can go back to um, stakeholders within the organization and deem this as uh, a success. And success metrics, do, uh, you have to measure these on an ongoing basis. It's not just once a year, it's an ongoing basis. And I'll talk a bit more about this um, in later slides. But that kind of finishes off the value framework. And really, the, the purpose of a value framework is to unlock information and get the organization thinking about some of the factors that maybe they overlooked uh, and getting everyone on the same page. Now, I want to take you through some of the best practices and some blueprints um, that we have gathered and captured, you know, um, over the course of the last two to three years. Next slide, please, Matthias. And a core fundamental of any successful um, secure coding program is your champions. Um, these are people who have shown an, an, incre uh, an interest in security that do not necessarily have to be from security background. They could be developers that have shown a keen interest, have attended training outside of their um, organization, Maybe they're contributing blogs to the organization around security, but really they, they want to cause an impact and want to work with security to increase development capabilities in the organization. And really what we've seen in the past is if your security champions come from a development background, it causes a great message within the organization because now developers are being pushed by their fellow peers rather than pushed by security. Uh, and security have a, a, a role in setting up the foundations, but if, if developers can drive the initiative, it, it means that the program will become more successful and at a quicker rate as well. Next slide, please, Matthias. The next part of the blueprint is all around making um, a secure code uh, program fun and engaging. And you can do this a number of ways, and one way we've seen in the past is, is actually running tournaments or one-time events that kind of captures the fun element um, uh, for developers, that they don't see this as a, a dull, boring training exercise, but it's more of a global or uh, maybe a team-based event that captures the imagination and inspires developers to learn in a maybe con uh, a competitive environment. Next slide, please, Matthias. The next part of the blueprint is really honing in on the content. So there's high-level content and maybe there's more language-specific um, content our framework specific content. And this is really important because whatever a developer um, consumes in a training platform, really you want that developer to be able to apply what they learned in their, in their everyday workflow. So giving them the training that they need and desire is really important. And focusing in on specific frameworks and languages will only help um, increase the awareness, increase the skills building within the development team. And also it's important to, uh, to note that Challenges shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't take developers hours and hours con to consume and complete. They should be short, um, snappy, uh, but continual um, over the course of a period of time. Next slide, Matthias. Also, and maybe this part is for more of a, a mature organization in their thinking, uh, and maybe a more mature AppSec uh, culture, but utilizing assessments and quizzes to identify benchmarks within that organization. Um, if you want to go from a, a junior developer to maybe an intermediate developer, there may be certain criteria or maybe certain assessments that that developer must pass in order to achieve that status. 
Um, it's also a great way to um, highlight that you, you're compliant in certain areas, that you can uh, provide assessments to developers or quizzes to developers um, to prove compliance in areas like PCI, DSS, HIPAA, etc., or even data handling when it comes to GDPR. Next slide, please, Matthias. And also, communication is a very important factor in any project, and especially in a new kind of project, a new secure coding program. Um, as Matthias mentioned before, there's certain language breakdown within the development community and security community. And really, if you can actually picture um, a, a very centralized communication process where developers know where to go when they want to find stuff about security and uh, even a secure coding program, and security can update that um, in a timely manner, but it has to be in a centralized location. And I would also recommend that you avoid, avoid emails. Developers get spammed with emails on a day-to-day -day basis. But maybe you want to utilize the existing tools. Maybe you're utilizing Slack within the organization. Maybe you have um, Confluence. Or maybe you're even using Yammer. But something that can deliver instant messages and timely messages to developers, whether that be an upcoming tournament, an upcoming assessment, or maybe just a general newsletter or a blog, it creates um, a culture of understanding between development and security in a seamless manner. And it's also a great way to recognize good behavior. For example, if you've got developers that excel in the training um, and follow that into their workflow, well, maybe they could be the AppSec warriors of the month. But reward and recognition go hand in hand with effective communication and an effective secure coding program. Next slide, please, Matthias. And finally, it's data. Data helps organizations improve no matter what um, area you're in. And it's no different in creating a secure coding program. You should link to success metrics. You should keep track of the, the program. Have I met my milestones? Have developers onboarded, etc.? Because it brings it to life. It brings the secure coding program to life. You can also provide um, that data around the strengths and weaknesses of your developers, maybe in a team level, a consolidated level, or even going granular into the developer themselves to understand their strengths, which is great, but also their weaknesses and highlight those weaknesses. And it's not about being the stick, it's about being the carrot. If you can highlight weaknesses and showcase a path to betterment for developers, you know, it resonates well with the development community that they want to be more, uh, they want to be better um, coders, but, and they also want to be better secure coders in the endeavor to deliver software in a better and more secure manner for their organization. And also it's important to bring visibility to stakeholders on a continual basis. Stakeholders want to get involved in an initiative like this. Your CISO, your head of application security, your, your head of app dev, they all want to get involved in this because they, they appreciate the struggle. Because when they get up to those levels, it's all about communication, it's all about metrics, and it's all about improving stuff. So um, bring this to your develop, or bring this to your stakeholders in the endeavor of creating a better program and continually innovating and improving the program. And a great way to to do this is actually pulling APIs or creating uh, different reports on a on a monthly, quarterly, or even a weekly basis, whatever your preference is. But we'll make sure they're there and make sure that they're automated as well. Next slide, please, Matthias. Matthias, I'm going to hand this over to you, which is all about capturing, I suppose, Secure Code Warrior's vision. Thank you very much, Sean. So yes, our, our vision with Secure Code Warrior is to empower developers to be the first line of defense in their organization by making security highly visible and providing them with skills and tools to write secure code from the beginning. Developers are your first line of defense. It does not make sense to um, put bits on bits to defend bits, um, because in, eventually, if you're putting a firewall on top of everything, well, it's again bits. Um, maybe we should start by tackling the root cause problem, which is developers are writing on a day-to-day -day basis code, and that needs to be secured. All right. And what we do with Secure Code Warrior is we provide you with skills and tools. So not only tools, but also skills. We want to make sure that you can build skill with within your development organization so that they know what to do so that they know how to write secure code from the start um, you can build skills but of course you need, can provide them with tools to give them also real-time guidance making sure that when they're writing code on a day-to-day -day basis they get 
instant feedback on how to write secure code. They should have their coding policies on the top, on the tip of their fingers to make sure that they are writing code in, in accordance to their um, coding policies. Sean? Yes, and as Matthias mentions, the developer um, is at the heart of our solution. And we've built a platform that actually engages developers and it's built for developers. So in our platform, we actually asked developers what would they like to see and you know they provided feedback with us and we built accordingly. So our platform is totally online. It's available 24-7 as long as you've got a web, uh, a web browser. It's hands-on, so it's immersive in the code and language specific that you're working in your day-to-day. -day. Developers build their functional skills by going to the command line and building applications and writing code. We want to create the same experience, learn by doing in our platform. It's gamified, and gamification can, can be a, a buzzword thrown around in education. My interpretation of gamification is giving developers the platform to showcase their skills and improvement, and also giving management the platform to recognize good behavior amongst um, their developers and also their peers. Um, compliance should be a byproduct of any good secure coding uh, program. And we just don't measure compliance. We actually go deeper into the analytics. We want to provide a holistic view of your organization when it comes to average strengths and weaknesses from a team level, so you can hone in on each individual team, and also for each individual developer. If they understand their strengths and also their weaknesses and how they can improve on those weaknesses, they become the better developers. And probably one of the most important factors, it's self-paced. And in a case study in a couple of moments' time, we'll be talking about how we overcome um, a developer's um, stringent workflow. Our platform is designed to be self-paced where developers, they don't have every uh, waking hour to spend on security and secure code training, but if we give them a platform that they can dive in and dive out when they want to and not overtax them with learning, um, it becomes a better message. And finally, it's tailored, and this is two-pronged. In every organization, no matter if you have 25 developers to 25,000 developers, you're going to have developers working in different tech stacks, um, maybe web app, mainframe, mobile app. And with that, you're also going to introduce different experiential levels. Um, you're going to have developers that have been around for 10 plus years that may or may not have a high degree of secure coding competency. And you might have developers coming out of university that might have a lower um, skill set when it comes to secure coding. But what we want to do is be able to cater um, for, for those um, those developers, no matter what tech stack and experience level they are. Next slide, please, Matthias. And, and to capture all this, we've built out various different modules. And I'm going to take you through some of the different use cases of these modules. So, for example, the tournament functionality, all about creating that general awareness for developers in a fun, competitive environment. A lot of our, our programs at Secure Code Wire is actually kicked off by a tournament of some sort. Um, and it, it creates that competitive environment where developers can learn, and it's, it's really fun. We've got an, an assessment module, which I kind of touched on uh, earlier on, which is all about qualifying the skill sets of your developers. Maybe you want to embed it into the hiring process of, in your organization, you want to be confident that if you're hiring a senior engineer, that they will have a certain degree of secure coding competency. Or maybe you want to create an assessment for career development if you want to go from a junior level to an intermediate or intermediate to maybe a, a, a champion developer well there might be a component of secure coding embedded in that and you have to pass that to get to the next level we've also got our learning and training and we always equate this to our cyber gym you go to a normal gym to and you engage continually you lift weights continually to build your muscle you come to our cyber gym and you engage on a continual basis to build your secure coding muscle memory and we've also got our real-time support in our IDE plugin. And Matthias, do you want to jump in here and speak about that? Absolutely. So Sensei is a real-time coaching plugin. So while your developers are doing this for real, you want to make sure that they are guided in the right direction. So you can train them through our platform with tournament mode, with assessments, with training and, and, and learning uh, um, sessions. However, the end goal should be that they have to do this in your code, in your technology, on a day-to-day -day basis for the features that they're building. So with Sensei, the Sensei can give real-time guidance so that your developer is producing secure code. And again, we take a positive approach. 
we're not saying to the developer, we're not pointing out the vulnerabilities that he's introducing into the code. No, what we're doing over here is we're putting forward secure coding guidelines so that when a developer is following these coding guidelines and they are shown in real time when he is writing code and when he is following the secure coding guidelines, he's going to produce secure code. Essentially what we're doing um, with the IDE plugin is we're taking the knowledge that people have across teams, the security knowledge that's already in the team, and we're making sure that everybody is aware of that security knowledge and not on a wiki page, not on a Confluence page, but really in the IDE. Last but not least, um, measuring. Um, you have to measure uh, what you're doing, um, but don't measure um, the training itself. Measure the output. Measure what people are doing on a day-to-day basis, basis. Measure how they not introduce problems into the code and how they are fixing problems into the code. Sean, I'll hand it back over to you for some customer studies, what we've seen in the field. Fantastic. Thanks, Matthias. So I want to take you through some actual real-life um, customer experiences and customer journeys that we've implemented at Secure Code Warrior. And the first one, and each have, has their own different team, uh, the first one is all about you know, impacting in a positive way via positive messaging and making learning fun. The second one is all about fitting into a developer's world. And finally, the real-time guidance, and I'll let Matthias take over that one. Um, at the la at our, is, is, it's our last case study. So the first case study um, is a tier one insurance company, IAG, down in Australia. And the challenges they had was they wanted to upskill developers quickly, but they also wanted to engage developers and resonate a positive message with developers. So they actually picked the team. And for all of you Game of Thrones fans, they actually um, put, picked that as their central team for rolling out a secure coding program, and they called it Game of Codes. So they identified their secure coding champions, they, and they identified um, the different a, um, areas in the organization where they wanted to run local tournaments, and then they actually upsc upscaled that into a more uh, APAC-wide tournament in the endeavor to um, onboard developers quickly, but also showcase that, okay, this is not just training, this is more than training, this is about building culture, and it's true fun, and it really got developers engaged in that. So my learning from this is, you know, really you have to think about the communication plan and maybe there's a team that you can uh, introduce to make it a bit more fun uh, and more engaging for developers. Next case study, Matthias. As I kind of mentioned a while ago, um, developers do not have every waking hour to spend on upskilling and secure coding or thinking about security. Uh, and this was the case in this particular tier one US financial institution. Um, they have hundreds, they have thousands of developers actually, and they wanted to, to train these developers, but developers were working in sprint uh, cycles and they didn't have that much time to spend and devote um, in one sitting on our platform. But what we recommended and what a management agreed with was if developers spend, uh, do one challenge a day, which equates to three to five minutes on our platform, um, every day, every business day, um, and do it continually. They actually measured at day one, and then they measured um, again in three months' time, and they saw a 60% increase in development capability. So from this, it means that you have to blend it into the developer's workflow. You can't um, have a secure coding program uh, and sticking out like a sore thumb. You actually have to blend it into their workflow and empathize with developers that, okay, you're busy, but we just want to do one challenge a day or do a small bit uh, of, um, of secure coding um, on a continual basis. If you do that, you can see an increase in capability as well. So for the final case study, Matthias, I'm going to pass it over to you. Sounds good. Um, what we've seen from our early adopter program with um, Sensei, which is not generally announced, but it is very coming very, very soon, is um, that people are able to fix code and um, fix problems faster in their code. Um, we've done a three month, um, we followed one company for three months, um, only five developers, and what we've seen is that they did not introduce um, close to 200 potential security problems into their organization. Um, if we look back into that organization, what it would otherwise have costed them 
um, to fix these 200 um, problems into the code, um, we actually saved close to 100 man days. So we, we saved that organization 100 man days of development time. In addition, moving forward or looking forward, um, what we've seen is that people tend to fix problems faster into their code. Um, so by installing these rules, by making sure that they are guided in real time, we were able to reduce the time to fix a problem into the code from three hours to 10 minutes. So for the covered categories, so for the categories that we said, hey, you know what, we're going to put some effort into there because, for example, we want to make sure that people follow coding guidelines so that there is no SQL injection into the code. Well, for these categories, we were able to drastically reduce the time it took to fix the code. So let's see. Um, let's wrap up, uh, Sean. Let's wrap up the presentation. Um, first of all, key takeaway is that it is 30 times more expensive to fix a vulnerability that is committed in the, into the code base than it is when fixing that one into the IDE. Um, super important because a lot of people are involved if that, that, that particular problem makes it into the code base. A lot of people will be involved to get rid of that um, security problem. Developers are really your first line of defense. Everything is bits and bytes. It does not make sense to build bits and bytes to protect bits and bytes. No, let's start with educating the developer to make sure that they can write secure code from the start and at the same time, if there are problems into the code, that they are able to fix that. Sean, are you going to take the last four? Yes, absolutely. Thanks, Matthias. So understanding your goals and priorities before you start is critical. Um, it's critical in understanding those from an organizational point of view, but also from your own point of view when you're on, when you're creating um, a high level or creating a strategic program for secure coding. A positive approach to security is game changing. Breaking down the traditional silos between security and development will help build a culture and help enable developers to write secure code. And it's all about empowering developers, um, and it's a key factor in creating secure coding. And then finally, don't measure training, measure the impact. As Matthias says, me measure the outpact, um, output, sorry. Measure the output in vulnerability densities. Is there a reduction in that? Maybe there's a reduction in the, pin, uh, the, the vulnerability seen in the pen test results. But it's key to measure the output, not the input. And that's a wrap up. And we're going to finish off with a short Q&A session. Um, is there any questions you can see there, Matthias? Absolutely. So thank you very much for all the questions. Let's go through it and see how far we can get. So the first question that came in is, how does this platform help improve the relationship between security and development teams? Have you seen a measurable difference in this area? Sean, are you going to take that question? Yeah, sure, Matthias. So traditionally, security and development have, have been in silos. What this program does, it breaks down those silos where security are setting up the foundations of the program, but really developers are driving this initiative and they're collaborating all the way. Um, maybe they're collaborating on the foundations of it together and implementing it together, or maybe security, as I said, are creating those foundations and developers are driving it and maybe they report to each other once in a while. But it's also breaking down that language bar barrier that developers now feel comfortable that security is doing something for them and empowering them. And at the same time, developers are understanding the language of security. And have I seen a measurable in difference in this area? I think it's more of a cultural uh, difference. If you've got a seamless cohesion between developers and security and they're working in a seamless manner, well, you can actually measure the impact in code quality um, and looking at the results and measuring that output. All right. Thanks, Sean. So um, next question that I see, do you need training to use Sensei? And I'll take that one for, um, uh, for myself. Um, so, well, so Sensei does link back to, to training. So if you do not understand something, you can go back and you t can take training, some, some very specific training on the stuff that you need to fix, some sort of just-in-time training. Um, but the way I would like to, to, to phrase this or the analogy that I would like to use is um, if you want to fly a plane, you tend to start with going into a simulator and learn about all the instruments um, before you're going to actually fly a plane. Um, you really want to understand everything, but your end goal is not really to be in that simulator forever and ever. No, your end goal is to really fly a plane and have an experienced co-pilot next to you 
to guide you through, for example, a storm that you've never experienced and so on and so forth. And the same is true um, with application security. I would say start with training, make sure you understand how to code securely, um, but then when you're actually doing it, make sure there is a solution like Sensei next to you that can guide you when you have to, for example, implement crypto and you didn't take any courses on crypto. So the Sensei solution can guide you at that point in time and point you back to the training where you can find relevant information. Can you find, uh, the third question, can you find a capable security champion in any dev team after a certain amount of training? How long would this take? I think that's a, that's a good question for you, Sean, right? Yeah, absolutely, Matthias. Uh, I suppose if you break this question down and first look at the de definition of a secure coding champion, really that depends on the organization. So some organizations actually get their security experts to be the secure code champions. And some organizations actually get developers that have shown a keen interest in security. So we'll take the latter. We'll take when you actually are handpicking developers. Well, this can be done before training or it could be done during training. And before training, it might be just a simple survey. Who wants to, a, sh a show of hands of who wants to be a secure code champion? And, and they're really driving the agenda. It might be developers that have shown a, a keen interest in the past or have participated in some workshops that security have ran. But really, it's, it's, it's about really empowering those people and acknowledging the, uh, their interest in security. When you're, when you're looking at the second part of it, maybe you want to identify um, secure code champions uh, during training. Um, well, maybe you can run a tournament and, you know, the top five people in that tournament, depending on how the tournament is set out or, and how many people are participate, they could be your initial set of secure coding champions. Now, a champion and maybe an AppSec warrior can be slightly different um, what we've seen in organizations. Your secure code champion could be actually a team lead on our platform that is driving the agenda. But at the same time, you want to recognize good behavior and good work. So you might have your AppSec warrior of the month. Um, and to identify these people, maybe it's, uh, again, it's about uh, rec recognizing good work and maybe recognizing who has um, accumulated um, some points on the platform who has increased their skills the most over the last month. So really, um, in terms of the definition, a security champion is helping drive the agenda, while maybe your AppSec warrior is um, a reward at the end of a month for a particular developer who has shown some good work on the training platform or even in development. Thanks, Sean. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Where does Sensei fit versus vulnerability finding solutions? Um, there's actually a, a couple different ways that I can answer this particular question. Um, so first of all, what Sensei is doing, it is based on secure coding policies. What it does, it is guiding developers in writing secure code so that vulnerabilities are not introduced into the code. Um, at the same time, what you can also, um, uh, the way you can answer this question in, in a different way is take all your application security solutions out there today. Um, and they all find vulnerabilities. Everything in AppSec is finding the problem, finding the OWASP top 10 and categorize it. Well, if you want to start fixing these issues, and if you want to make sure people will not introduce that same problem, that's when you need Sensei. That is when you say, hey, you know what? Um, we would like to make sure that we can fix these problems and that we can make sure that people do not introduce them. What you're essentially going to do with Sensei is going to, you, what, people, what people call baselining. There's a number of vulnerabilities into the code and we're aware of them and we're not going to fix them. We're just going to make sure um, we're not going to introduce any new ones. Well, with Sensei, what you can do is you can actually make sure that you're also going to fix and lower that baseline. You're going to make sure that you see a decrease in number of vulnerabilities in your bug tracking system on security. All right, with that, I would like to conclude this um, webinar um, and I would like to give some time back to you guys. Sean, thank you very much for, for doing this webinar together. Thanks, Matthias. And with that, um, uh, we're looking forward to hear and see you in the next webinar in October. Thank you very much.